believe. That's why I've warned you repeatedly, cautioned to you, that anybody who comes up and changes words in the Bible, what they don't realize is, is they're actually undermining the security of the scriptures. And then when things come to get bad, goes from bad to worse, then all of a sudden you're looking to the scriptures and then that doubt will come in and go, well, does that word really mean what that word means? All the devil has to do is, is to just plant a question mark in your mind and that can prevent you from moving forward. Uh, what will happen is sometimes you'll hear something and you're sure you'll hear it. And, and, and then the next thing you know, you run off with something and you think, well, where did that thought come from? That's demonic. That's the devil. And just because you're saved doesn't mean you can't have demonic influences. And so one of the things that's important, and I've been mentioning it, but we have enough new people here that I think it's imperative that you understand. When we talk about following the Apostle Paul, we're not hyper dispensationalists and only follow the prison epistles, which cuts out the Lord's Supper and also cuts out baptism. We follow Paul because God told us to follow Paul. And the reason is, as he said, follow Paul as he follows Christ. God gives you God ordained authority down here on this earth. Romans 13 has to do with authority. And what it tells you in Romans 13 is, is you obey the magistrates and the people that are over you because why? that's what God ordained. They're ministers of God for good, not to evil. And, you, and it says there that if you, uh, they don't bear the sword in vain, but you don't have to fear them if you haven't done anything wrong. He set up the authority in the household. Mom and dad are over the children. It's supposed to be that way. That's how God ordained that. Now you're seeing that all turned upside down now. Everything's turned around. That is being done. It's a demonic entity what has happened. And the devil's problem was he hated authority. The devil said, God's not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to be like God. Okay, but there's a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy in hell. There's a hierarchy in heaven. And, <coughs> and because, excuse me, because of that, if you don't follow that line or that chain of authority, you're going to find yourself out from under that authority and therefore out from under the protection that Scripture provides. We all have a problem taking orders from anybody but ourselves. There was a movement, uh, a, a Jesus only movement that came out years and years ago. And in that Jesus only movement, it was everybody following Jesus. Well, now you're in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, they no longer do uh, what the judges are telling them to do. They're now doing, every man's doing that which is right in his own eyes. Now, if you'll take your time to read through Judges, you'll find a sort of a trestus on how America is nowadays. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. Well, I just think this, I just feel this, I just said, nobody can tell me what to do. Everybody has an opinion. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And so what happens is, is if you don't understand that, listen, the Bible teaches you that the disciples, the disciples, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The disciples, where's the word disciple come from? It's the root word of the word discipline. The Christian life requires discipline. You have to learn to walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh. That has to do with submission. That has to do with realizing my life is not my own. More times than just the Garden of Gethsemane does the Lord say, nevertheless, not my will but thine. Constantly when the Lord's down here, he's checking with the Father. I have always done that which was the will of the Father. I always done that which is the will of the Father. Father, would you do this? I want you to do that. So you have to understand there's a principle there. So when it comes to this thing about following the Apostle Paul, I'm going to give you something and I don't always encourage you to write notes down, but I'm going to encourage you to write these things down because it sets the foundation or what they would call in court of precedent for you to understand that the Bible, the Pauline epistles, that's Romans to Philemon, all 13 of them, and probably also the book of Hebrews, those things operate like glasses for you to view the whole Bible through. So if you find something all the way back in the Old Testament and it doesn't conflict with what the Apostle Paul writes, it's all right for you to be able to take that and utilize it in a practical application. Doctrinally, it may not fit for you, but practically it does. 
For instance, there are a number of things in the book of James, and James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad and so on and so forth. We all know that, but you can't just lock James down and say that's only for tribulation saints and only for the time of the tribulation. No, there's a lot of good things in the book of James that don't conflict with Paul's writings, and therefore you can utilize those in a practical sense. So when you have a doctrinal application and then you have a practical application, and there's also sometimes a spiritual application of the same thing. The whole Bible is written for you, but not the whole Bible written to you. Once you understand that, but in order for me to get it, I have to know what am I looking through. So I have to take what the Bible says. So when you get into the book of Hebrews and you see the verses, Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews as a matter of fact, when you see the verses that are in those places that conflict with the Apostle Paul's writings, you don't throw them out of the Bible. You just know it's not for you. And once you get a hold of that, the whole Bible begins to come together and formulate a picture where you begin to realize there's no contradictions in the Bible at all. <laughs> so if I'm reading through my Old Testament, I read through that and I can't eat anything with a cloven hoof and fins and scales. Well, then we're all in trouble because that's a, that's a sin in the Old Testament. That's where your Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witness get hung up, which that's the way where you go and say, well, that's more shrimp and lobster for us and catfish too, for that matter. Scales, they, catfish don't have scales, they got skin. And so, uh, so then I come to Timothy and Timothy said, every creature is God, uh, uh, every creature is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with prayer and thanksgiving. That means I can eat anything. You can eat pigs in the New Testament. You can't eat it in the Old Testament. There's nothing like good bacon without nitrates and all the other junk in it or a good pork roast or a, a good a pork chop, medium rare. It's not a, that's a good thing with a little uh, chicken gravy on it and that kind of thing and cook just a little crust on it, not too bad. <laughs> and maybe some red cabbage and raisins there with it and some mashed potatoes and... I, I didn't eat breakfast this morning. <laughs> I'm getting carried away. But, but, but here's the thing. God says every creature of God, that means I can eat it. It doesn't mean now if I have dietary restrictions because I got whatever the doctor says is wrong with you, that it's good for you to eat it, right, right. but you can eat it. Right. Now then what happens? Oh, well, if that means everything is good, then I can go ahead and drink liquor. Okay, wait a minute. There's tons of passages where Paul writes about what liquor's for and it's not for you. So you can't throw the blanket there. Why? It conflicts with the Apostle Paul. Does that make sense to you? Now, what's important for you to know is, is to write down, I'll give you, I don't know, eight or 10. We'll depend on time here this morning. I'll give you eight or 10 of them to show you that Paul sets himself up in an unusual way. He becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. That's what you are before you're saved. Now you're the church. In the Bible, this is basic rightly dividing, and I recommend you get Brother Walker's book on rightly dividing. It's the definite, uh, 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 the, the, the definitive work on it anymore. It combines all of the best of the best and puts it in an easy place and an easy to broken down, at least the first book. The second book's a little tougher. The third book will be a little harder than that. But I recommend you get that. But what I'm giving you is rightly dividing. In the Bible, there are three people that talk. God talks. The devil talks. And people talk. You have to find out who's talking. Now you have to find out who are they talking to. Are they talking to the Jew? Are they talking to the Gentile? Are they talking to the church? Now where people get things messed up there is, is they take things that are written to the Jew and they say that the church has replaced the Jew. The church hasn't replaced the Jew. I'll give you all the passages that have to do with that and I've given to you on a number of occasions for you to understand that the promises that are written to the Jew are earthly physical problem, promises and they're for being down here on the earth, ladies and gentlemen. They're not for you. You may or may not have prosperity here. You may or may not have wisdom here. <coughs> you may or may not have multitude of children here. None of that. That's Jewish promises. Increasing your borders and all that other kind of stuff unless you have a whole lot of money. Um, you're not going to increase your borders at all. That's not a promise to you. That's a promise to the Jew. Amen. You can't go pray a prayer of Jabez. Amen. 
You say, well, what if I go on the Daniel diet? Well, just mow your grass every Saturday, put it in a glass blender and add a little water and I can guarantee you, you'll lose weight. <laughs> call it whatever you want to call it. But, but the bottom line is, is that in the, in the New Testament, he said that in the last days, they'll come and they'll do two things in their preaching. Number one, forbidding to marry. That's just shack up and hang up and hang out together and abstaining from meats. You're a meat eater. Well, I'm a vegetarian. And all. Okay, well, that's what you want to do. But the Lord tells you you're supposed to eat meat. Amen. Yep. You say, why? There's proteins and amino acids and things like that. Well, you know, to give you cholesterol. I, okay. I'm just telling you what the book says. Amen. So, so you do what you want to do with that. But you have people right now that are using the, the, the Bible to tell you that, listen, you may need to do that. For because of dietary problems or sugar problems or whatever the doctor tells you. But there's nothing wrong with somebody that sits down and has a steak. Look, if you want to eat the vegetables, I'll give you mine. Give me your steak. <laughs> <coughs> no problem at all. Preacher, you can't eat that lobster. It's a sea roach. I mean, it crawls around on the bottom. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take yours. You don't want it. You go ahead and you can have my potatoes and whatever else they serve with it and all that and all that. You can't eat crabs. I'll take it. Amen. Blue crab, deep fried, soft shell crab, little butter. You never lived. You've been a good crab boy, man. I don't want all that corn and all that other stuff floating around in there, man. You're wasting space, man. <laughs> Give me the other little thing with them pinchers in it. That's what I want. Now, if you grab a hold of that, there's a lot of liberty in that. You're not confined to dietary laws because keeping dietary laws for you is no longer a prerequisite to whether or not you're in fellowship with the Lord. So I'm going to give you some things here about the Apostle Paul and try my best to explain to you what the Apostle Paul says and let you see it from Scripture to know the importance of the authority of Scripture. Now, you're going to run into people over time and as man increases his intellect and thinks he's getting smarter and smarter, they're going to question the old things. They're not going to question New American Standard and New King James and all that other stuff. They're going to question the authority why is it that all of those Bibles never say we're better than the other one that was just printed, 380 something of them now? It's always we're better than the King James. Why is that? Because the King James is the authority. And so because of that, they kick the authority. And that's part of the problem that happens nowadays. The issue I'm telling you, the issue is authority. Who am I taking my orders from? I'm telling you, you are safe taking your orders from that book, Rightly Divided. Amen. And God sets it up in a certain fashion. Now think about it. If you were God and you knew you could speak to God to people directly through prayer and through Bible reading, why would you call preachers, teachers, and evangelists? <laughs> That's how God set it up. I didn't set it up that way. I wouldn't have set it up that way. I just have a whole bunch of individual robots doing whatever they wanted to do. But the problem is, as God knows, that creates chaos. David runs through that Old Testament. And he's talking about his mighty men. And there are some mighty men. They do some unbelievable feats. I like the one that goes down because he's bored one day and he just walks down on a snowy day and walks down into a pit and kills a lion. <laughs> Well, he was bored to death. It's like he went down the pit and killed a lion on a snowy day. For what? He's bored. Nothing better to do. I've got to go kill something. I'll go kill me a lion. I like uh, what's his name that defends his pea patch, you know, and stands there and kills all them people. And Samson with the jawbone of a donkey and wiping out all. I like those kind of things. But ladies and gentlemen, that stuff is the Old Testament. Now you're not riding the path of the second advent. Now you're supposed to minister with a towel, not a sword. Amen. 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 And you have the benefit of something they didn't have. And when David was bragging on those mighty men, you know what he kept saying? He'll tell you in one place, he tells you four times, these are they which could keep rank. These are they which could keep rank. These are they, I mean, they had rank. They had unbelievable abilities but even their ability did not vault them above whoever was over them. 
I'm telling you the issue is authority. And whenever you have a problem with authority, you're going to have a problem with God. God doesn't bless things that way. Last thing before we get into the passages here in 1 Timothy. God always does things decently and in order. If it's chaotic, if it creates envy, strife, division, that's carnal and chaotic, that's not God. That's the devil. But I guarantee you, whenever you see that, there's an authority issue. Authority issue is at the bottom of envy and covetousness. You think they have something that you deserve and they shouldn't have it. You have a problem with them having it. Some of you have a problem with your boss. Say, so I don't either. Okay, your husband. <laughs> and some of you husbands have a problem with your boss. The Lord. And what you see in your wife is what God sees in you every day. Amen. If that woman is just shut up and do what I tell her to do, and the Lord said, mm-hmm. Oh there you go. Spot on, preacher. All right, First Timothy. Miss Barbara's husband's gone on home now, so she can say the amen. <laughs> All right, let's start off this thing here. Father, bless your word here. Thank you for the good group of folks already gathered here. Pray now you'll be with us as we dig into these things. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, 1 Timothy chapter number one verse, no, one, verse number 15. This is the faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation. And Christ Jesus came into the world to save of whom I'm chief. Paul, what a way to talk about yourself. Paul's the epitome of humility. Paul goes from, I was uh, somebody, I was a big shot, I was everything I should have been in Philippians 3, above the law, blameless of the tribe of Benjamin. I had all the garments and all the robes and all everything you could have, trained at the feet of Gamil. Uh, a big time lawyer, so on and so forth, the Perry Mason of my day. And then Paul says, I count it all but dung. Right. You know what Paul said about himself here? I'm chief of sinners. That's after he's saved. Yeah. If he's the chief, man, that's, that's a good place to have enough chiefs, no Indians. Paul, Paul said that. You ever look at Paul's life? You'd have a hard time finding him sinning. Like a little girl told me one time, she came in and she said, Preacher, I just feel so bad. I, I, I've been doing really bad. And I said, what do you mean you've been doing bad? I said, listen, I'm going to have my collar turned around backwards. I'm not a confessor. You tell the Lord about it. But I'm so burdened about it. I'm so burdened about it. I, I just feel terrible. I've been horrible all week long. And I'm thinking to your parents or your teachers or something like that. And I said, well, what in the world did you do? And she said, I promised the Lord I'd read 10 chapters every day. And I only made it three days. I said, excuse me, sister, I need to run to the altar. I'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> I feel terrible about it. My goodness, man. What a thing to do. All right, and Paul says, I'm chief of sinners. And then Paul says in verse 16, How be it for this cause I, I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul says he's a pattern. In this case, the Apostle Paul is a pattern. Come to Romans 11. Paul is a pattern on how to be long-suffering with people because the Lord was long-suffering with you. Let me say that again. Paul said, I'm to be a pattern. The verse 15 before that contextually is, I'm chief of sinners. And Paul said, the Lord reminded me of that. Why? I'm to be a pattern of long suffering. You have family members that are lost. You have family members that are not living right. You have family members that aren't doing what they ought to be doing. Well, all you have to do is, is look back and consider, has the Lord been long suffering with you? Amen. Well, don't be any more long suffering with them than God was with you. Don't let your reputation get in the way and you're so worried about what people might think about you as a parent or a grandparent or whatever that you don't give God time to work with them and deal with them. My dad said a lot of things that I remember very well, but one of the things he said to a man that came up and asked him some questions about a, a, a young teenager and the guy was real disappointed and ready to yank the chain and do some other things like that. And my dad paused for a minute and then he just said, well, he said, I've just learned this. Yeah, what's that, preacher? He said, I've learned that you really don't know how kids are going to turn out until they get, say, around 40 years of age. 
Now that was said back over 35 or 40 years ago. My dad's been gone this year, has been gone 30 years. So that thing had to have been said because I was a tyke back then. So that had to have been said maybe 40 or 50 years. Now, can you imagine how that's progressed? So now you might have to say until they're 50. Yes. Kids are immature as all get out nowadays. I mean, you, got, you have no manhood anymore. Amen. You ask somebody to come into your house or one of your kids and say, can you change a light bulb? And they're like, the first thing they're like is, well, if you use LEDs, they don't burn out. No, I'm still, I'm talking about the ones you, 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 you turn, well, can you call a maintenance man? Lord help you if they got a flat tire Amen. or they need to change the oil. If you grew up in the 60s and 70s, man, if you didn't know how to change the oil, change the oil filter, change the air filter, and you couldn't survive. And nowadays, they're, nowadays what they blow up is all these techie people. And you always got to have a man come in there. That's why the woman falls in love with a plumber because he knows how to handle a wrench. <laughs> and every time they ask, you know, Mr. Tech, you can't find an app for that. <laughs> an, an app don't, an app. Amen, I'm telling the truth. It's funny, you get a little stiff on me there. Is there an app for that? You know, three of these big old boys up here yesterday and my wife was here while I was at the hospital and doing some things. And she said, man, I haven't seen young men like that in a long time. She said, I got three weeks worth of work done in a half a day because they just get down there and get the stuff done. Somebody's taught them how to use their hands. That was a big deal, teach you how to use your hands and that kind of thing. Nowadays, we don't teach kids how to use their hands. Light bulb. Well, I don't know how to change the light bulb. Is there an, is there an app for that? I don't. Oh, good night, man. If we ever have to go back to coffee uh, makers, not percolators, but you ever have to go back to the ones you have to take a scoop and put it in a thing and then turn it on and you have to wait for it to quit dripping before you can pour it, <laughs> you're going to have a mutiny in America. People are going to go crazy because now you've got a pod thing and all you do is mash it. One fellow told me, he said, oh, I don't even do that anymore. And he said, I load it at night. It comes on automatically in the morning. When I wake up, it's ready. I said, I have one of those too. She gets up in the morning before me. <laughs> All right, are you in Romans chapter number 11? Romans chapter 11. And look in verse number, uh, oh, let's see, 12 or 13. Paul says this, for I speak to you, look at it, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gen Gentiles, I magnify my office. Paul's never big about telling you I'm the big dog, I'm the big cheese, I'm the, I'm the main guy y'all need to listen to. Paul said, I'm telling you my office, my responsibility is, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. Come a couple of pages, Romans 15. Now you should mark these things. You say, why? I'm trying to give you the mindset, you're safe following him. You're safe using Pauline epistles as your glasses to view the Bible through. And if it conflicts with Pauline epistles, you don't cut it out of your Bible. You just simply say, well, that's not for me because it conflicts with the Apostle Paul. When you run into the uh, book of Revelation and you see a faith and work system set up there, that's somebody that has to uh, uh, have the faith in Jesus Christ and keep the commandments, Revelation 12 and 14. Uh, you, you look at that and you say, okay, well, somebody does, but that's not me. Why? I'm not going to be here in the tribulation. I'm going to be at the judgment seat. Amen. So I don't have to worry about that. But somebody does. Well, I don't cut it out of the Bible and now turn it into, a, well, what that actually means is, is that if you're really saved, you'll keep the commandments. Right. No, it doesn't. It means if you don't keep the commandments, you're not saved in the tribulation. If you had to keep the commandments to be saved, how long would you stay saved? <laughs> Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before. Yep. There we go. Thou shalt not covet. Mm. There we go. Thou shalt not steal. Mm. Well, the preacher, see, you're always thinking about it's uh, stealing. Is uh, stealing? Have you ever stolen somebody's reputation? <clears throat> okay, well, let's move on. I'm going to preach it now. It's like, I thought you was teaching us something, preacher. All right, Revelation chapter, or Romans chapter 15, excuse me. Look in verse number 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because the grace that is given to me of God. 
The grace that he has there is a ministry. That's a ministry. God gave him the grace to have that ministry. Paul's ministry was a direct change from everything that had been taught. God had to give him a special helping of grace to be able to stick with that and not try to intermingle it with everything he had been taught. Now think about it. He has no writings or anything that goes along with what God gave him to tell people. You think it's hard for you to share the gospel right now. The Apostle Paul had to start off using Jewish people to start, and now he goes to Gentiles, and he's preaching something that has never been preached before. Now you think that's not a tough thing to do? Paul said, the Lord gave me a special helping of grace. Now look at the next verse. That I, the apostle, not we, I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the who? Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be accepted being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Paul said, I'm the one that's going to the Gentiles and I have a special message for those Gentiles and those Gentiles have to get saved the way that uh, I'm telling them to get saved. Come to Romans 16. Now, if an individual wanted to get saved back in the days of Paul, then those, uh, I mean, before Paul, they had to get saved by the gospel of the kingdom. Peter continued to preach the gospel of the kingdom after the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter never even preached the resurrection of Christ. Peter preached, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Right? Any of you ever heard that preached before? That's a gospel. Paul didn't preach that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, that's the passage on carnality and so on and so forth. And I'm of Cephas and I'm of Apollos and uh, I'm of Paul and I'm of Jesus. And Paul comes in there and he says, uh, I didn't come to baptize. But Paul baptized... But he's saying, I didn't come to preach that gospel of baptism for salvation. I came to preach the gospel. We believe in baptism. We baptize people, but not for salvation. Baptism for you is an ordinance that's left behind for us to continue to practice as a testimony of a good conscience toward God. It's a humbling kind of a thing. It's an outward testimony of what's already occurred inwardly. And so when we get ready to baptize, it's a picture of your salvation. But you don't have to be baptized to be saved. But there, in order to reveal the Messiah, that's John. That's in John chapter number uh, one there, when the apostle John is baptizing, it was to reveal the Messiah. And so what happens is, is he says, repent and be baptized. Well, you don't have to repent and be baptized. You have to repent and be saved. So what is repent? Repent is just a matter of changing your mind. Don't get this idea that that's a work. It means I don't want to go to hell. This eternal decree stuff is coming up again. That's this Calvinism foolishness. And that means that these eternal decrees are put down before God, before the foundation of the earth, uh, that, you know, God picked this one and didn't pick that one, and that's just how it is. That's called the sovereignty of God and this and that and the other. No, it is a decree that's there that if you're not in Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. Amen. I'm going to mess up the decree. I'm not going to hell. Amen. You say, why? I'm going to him. And I'm going to get saved and I'm going to come to Calvary and I'm going to get saved through him. What about that eternal decree? I just messed it up because now I got a way to get saved. That's Paul's gospel, death, burial, resurrection. That's why he died. Not foreordained before the foundation of the world. Your preordination in Romans chapter number eight has to do with being conformed to his image. It has nothing to do with your salvation. The predestination there has to do with if you get saved, he's already promised you a body like his. Yes. Hey. Uh, watching that elderly woman go out yesterday is so ugly to watch him go out that way with all that rattling and snorkeling and all that stuff going on and changes in the way they look. I know you can't make it pretty for nothing, man. And you're looking at all that stuff and thinking, I'm going to have, gonna have a new body, going to 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 have a new body. Now you start getting old and you're being honest yes. and you stand there after you get out of the shower and look in the mirror. <laughs> That's an indelible impression you don't ever forget. It's like, <laughs> and in your mind, you're like, well, I didn't have it drawn up like that. And the Lord said, well, that's the real, you get mad and you want to bust the mirror. It's kind of like, I feel like I'm in a carnival or something. What is all of that? And the Lord said, that's you, old man. Those are wrinkles. What's that old, the marks on your skin? It's a old age spots. 
What's wrong with you? You're falling apart, you old bag. That's why we wear clothes. You say, why? It makes us look younger. <laughs> Buy a new suit. Why? That's an indicator you need a new body. Romans chapter 16. Sure, man, that's the predestination. You get conformed to his image. I'm looking forward to that day. I don't, I, I don't, I don't like my image. You say, well, you know, well, you know, you're not the worst looking thing in the world. Won't you be glad when you're not having to worry about who you're better looking than? Yeah. Amen. And magazines and television ads and all the other kind of stuff. You go into almost every doctor's office nowadays. They've all gotten into this trying to make you ageless stuff. Like they got eternal life for you in a shot called Botox or something. Take the wrinkles out of your head. Hi, how are you? You need to smile every now and then. I am smiling. <laughs> Can you blink? No. It's, uh, I know mannequins like that if they still have them in department stores and all that kind of a deal. They're trying to, they're trying to make you turn back the hands of time. Well, do the best you can, but it's a losing battle, I'll tell you that. You know, I, I mean, I mean, I'm not talking about just be a pig and be sloppy and all that stuff. But I mean, do the best you can. You're dressing up a corpse. Amen. Amen. And one day, no matter what, is gone. Amen. Conform to his image, a new body. I don't know if I was him. I don't know that I'd want to take the parts left over. He comes down and gets our body and changes it. And I'm thinking, you know, that's another miracle in and of itself because How'd you turn that into that? Because you didn't have much to work with. Yeah. But he does. There's something connected with it. He comes back to get it. Why didn't he just give you a brand spanking new one? But it won't. You look in the mirror, you're not going to look like you. Amen. You imagine the conflict in heaven. If you look like you. I watch you women. You know, you, God bless your heart. I, I do, but I watch you. You watch some woman comes in late. Man, I'm telling you what, you will look at her, you'll start at her toes and then you'll, well, her belt doesn't match her shoes. And look at that purse. She's just carrying that purse because, mm -hmm, yeah. And I look at her jewelry. I, what, what, you get to heaven, you think it'll be like that? Your eyes will be on Jesus. You won't care about all that. That's human nature now. It's human nature. Men are like that. Men are this way though. I have to be fair and balanced this morning. The men are like this. You already got a big old barrel hanging over. You hadn't seen your tops of your shoes in a long time, you know, and that kind of thing. So here's how you, here's how you dress it up. Back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Back when I used to, you know, you don't look nothing like that anymore, Pop. <laughs> that hair's done moved back and that belly's done moved out, man. <laughs> I mean, there's snow on the roof and a shed over your feet. <laughs> and you exercise more and you get less results out of it. You exercise, what is that? And getting in and out of the car, man. <laughs> I was getting ready to leave the hospital yesterday and uh, just before she went home and I, I'm getting ready to go and my sister looks at me and she said, well, go on now, we're, we're good. And I said, I'm going. She said, well, go on and go. And I said, I'm going. And she said, well, why don't you go? I said, I'm thinking about how far it is from where I am to where I'm parked. I gotta, I gotta get my mind right for that. That's a long trip. She goes, oh yeah, there's that, you know. <laughs> All right, look in Romans chapter number uh, 16 now. Look in verse number 25, establishing that Paul is the uh, apostle. Uh, verse number 25. Now to him that is the power established to establish you according to whose gospel? Oh, did Jesus ever preach, <coughs> excuse me, did Jesus ever preach that gospel? Jesus never preached the death and the burial and the resurrection. You're here today and you're a Bible scholar, find it. Amen. Jesus never preached that. Paul says in Galatians chapter number one, though we are an angel from heaven preach to you any other gospel than that which I preached, let him be what? Christ. Jesus didn't preach it. Peter didn't preach it. Until you get to Acts 15, Peter said, I agree with Paul, there was a change. 
So what he says, my gospel. So how do you get saved in this age? If you don't rightly divide your Bible, you'll follow the wrong gospel. Amen. You don't have to tell everybody we're rightly dividing. You know what you do? You just give them the gospel. There's a lot of people that don't agree with rightly dividing the Bible. Don't get in a big argument with them. Here's what you do. How, what gospel do you believe you have to get? To? Oh, death, burial, and resurrection, scarlet thread all the way through the Bible. Okay, okay, we're good. Because that's how you get saved in this age. Arguing with them over what's going on in the tribulation and stuff. You ain't going to be here for it anyway. Don't worry about it. Make a mountain out of a molehill. Now to him that is the power according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which is kept secret since the beginning, since the world began. Who got that? The apostle Paul got that. It was given to him specifically. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. And look in verse number uh, 15, 14. I write not these things to shame you, but, my, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. That's people that are saved under Paul's ministry. They become his sons, his grandsons in the ministry. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. That's Paul's converts. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of... Okay, pretty silly. I mean, pretty straightforward, isn't it? Yes. Look in your Bible at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Paul tells you to follow him. Now, this is, the, this is the importance, ladies and gentlemen, of your testimony. I know that you're, you're living in a day and time where having clean living and talking about having a testimony is a very um, touchy subject anymore. Uh, it's still right to have a good testimony. And most churches won't tolerate you telling them that you should live a clean life. I just talked to somebody at the hospital a couple of days ago, and he was talking about a particular individual. He said, you know the strangest thing in the world? That guy was a deacon at a church. And he said this about his, uh, uh, about his life in his testimony. He said, well, my business life is different from my Christian life. How do you do that? I conduct my business different than I do my... How do you do that? Paul says, follow me. Paul said it's important how you live. Come down to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Look in verse number 1. Be ye followers of... But now watch. Even as I also am of... Paul's not saying follow me if I divert from that pathway. Well, let me ask you a question. How would you know he's diverting from the pathway if you didn't know the pathway? Amen. Do you have a Bible in your lap? Yes, sir. Okay. Then if you were going to follow me as I follow Christ, then you could tell if I'm following Christ because you got the road map in your lap. Amen. You can't take my word for it. You can't take my interpretation of it. You simply look at what the book says and then you're just like, okay, well, I can follow him because here he's following what the Lord did. That way, if I begin to change the gospel and say, now we've changed what we're going to do now and in order for you to be saved, you better get baptized. You say that ain't what the road map says. See? Take your Bible, come over to uh, Galatians 2. Let me give you two more real quick. I didn't realize I'm running a little behind here. Galatians chapter 2. I don't know, we had some folks join the church today, and if you would, I'd like to just postpone that to next week. Um, uh, I, I got some things I need to do after church today, so I hope you'll understand that and try to uh, move right into the uh, service here just shortly. Galatians chapter number 2. And come all the way down to, uh, let's see, make it seven. Paul says this, but contrary wise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that's Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. 
Uh, for he wrought effectually in Peter the apostleship of the circumcision, that's the Jews. The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. When James and Cephas, that's Peter again, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Uh, circumcision. And then Paul gets down there with Peter because Peter starts mixing the gospel with uh, Judaism there. And Paul and Peter have a, a discussion. Paul says, I withstood him to his face. And we came to an agreement. And Peter said, I realize things have changed now. All right, look in Ephesians chapter 3. We'll close on this one and we'll give you the rest of these this evening. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, what is that? Establishing a pattern. <coughs> So when a preacher gets up, uh, I don't care if you're a TV preacher, a well-known preacher, or you're visiting some church for the holidays or for summertime while you're on vacation, and he goes contrary to that, it's not you stand up and raise Cain about it. You just simply know in your heart that guy's not giving you the right gospel. He's not giving you the death, of burial, resurrection, or he's adding something to it or convoluting it by taking something away from it. And so one of the things that's a big deal nowadays is, is, well, you just believe, but you can't repent because if you repent, you're actually adding words. Well, what they're taking is, is repentant is, is that you're, I, I'm turning from my sin. No, I'm turning from the path I'm on. I'm moving toward hell and I want to go to heaven. I'm just turning around. The repentance is, is Lord, I know I'm a sinner. You can't name them all. It's impossible for you to name them all. And so all you do is, well, you have to name every single one of them. I bet you've had more sins now called to your mind than you did when you first got saved. You say, why? Because you become more educated in what sin is. So what do you do? Will you repent again? No, what they do is retread you. Well, if you did this and this and this and this and this, you must not have really been saved. Well, maybe I wasn't old enough to know th those things. I got saved when I was a kid. I wasn't smoking cigarettes or nothing, but you know, you can't now say because I decided, to, I didn't, but I decided to pick up the habit of smoking cigarettes that all of a sudden I wasn't saved because I wasn't living it. I wasn't old enough to smoke. Well, he must not have been saved because he's not serving Jesus. No, I just didn't. Now it's available and I shouldn't do it. I've committed a sin. It's wrong for me to do it. It's bad testimony, so on and so forth. What happens to me? I didn't lose my salvation I got when I was seven but now I've learned I'm out of fellowship and I need to repent of that and ask the Lord to forgive me and then put the habit down. You with me? Amen. But what they'll do is, is they'll retread you and say, the reason you committed adultery was you never were saved. Because if you were saved, you wouldn't have done that. So then all of a sudden, people that have been in church 30 years and messed up, they're like, oh, well, the reason I messed up, I was never saved. Well, you just whitewashed the whole thing, and justified it. Ephesians chapter number three, look in verse number one. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you who? Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to everyone, it's given to who? Paul to you word. So the apostle Paul has made known the revelation. He made known unto me the mystery as I wrote to you in a few words. So you get that by the Apostle Paul. If you don't get it from the Apostle Paul, then you got the wrong gospel. And the Bible is what we call uh, lost. You're not saved. You say, why? If you're trusting your catechism, or you're trusting your godfather and godmother, or your baptism at eight days old, or whenever they do it nowadays, if you're trusting your salvation, we've had them come here from the Church of Christ, and you think that because of that, uh, that you're saved and those kind of things, you're lost. Right. Now you can be hard headed about that and say, well, I don't really care. It's just how I believe and go on and go to hell with that. Or you can say, well, I don't want to be lost. Okay, well then why don't you see us and let us lead you to the Lord? Right. Don't be stubborn about it. Don't let religion damn you. Right. Well, I've been in church all the time. I don't, I don't care what church you've been a part of all your life. Well, Papa was a preacher. I, and it don't make no difference. Is there a time in your life where you came to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I don't want to go to hell when I die and I'm trusting you to save my soul. I believe you died for me, were buried and raised again the third day and I'm confessing you as my only way out. And if not, I'm not looking for a date and time. I'm simply saying to you, have you done that? That you ran headlong into the Lord 
well, I was at camp, you know, and a bunch of girls went down all that. I, no, you personally, individually, it's in corporate. It's not nation. Amen. It's individual. Yeah. And if you haven't had that, then you're lost. I hate to see you go to hell from a church pool pew. What a place to go to hell from. Yeah. Where were you when you went to hell? I was in the bar, man. Where were you? I was at a movie house, man. Where were you? I was at some place I shouldn't have been, you know. Where were you? I was sitting in church, man. You were in church, yeah. That's sad to me. I don't rejoice over that at all. There'll be people all day today, religious people, good people. You say, what happened? Well, a bomb hits today, they're gone right from a church pew. Father, bless your word. Sure do appreciate all you've done.